I believe that somebody came for a word on today. So I ask that you will have your way. Do whatever you need to do. Set free. Make a way out of no way. Encourage, comfort, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you will make a shift in somebody's life. That you will make a shift in all of our lives. So at the end of this day, we leave out of here differently than the way we came. Lord, we love you. Lord, we stand in victory. Lord, we stand knowing that you are able to do all things. So right now, even right now, Lord, before it's even done, Lord, we stand in victory and give you the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we say together, amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together. We got to
we're accustomed to staying in the region of where we ask them. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and cried. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. The word of God for the people, God, we say thanks. Be unto God, you may be seated. Just for a few moments, my brothers and my sisters, I want us to focus upon the subject, the benefits of a persistent God. The benefits of a persistent God. In 1960, an award-winning and, and best-selling author wrote a book that has not only been read in this country, but across the world. Translated in nine different languages, this best-selling publication has reached beyond any racial, economic, and geographical barriers, therefore touching the lives of men. In fact, I must be honest to tell you, Mosby, that my, I myself have been impacted and inspired by the manner in which the author carefully chooses his words with the strategic purpose of getting his point across. My attention, my brothers and my sisters, has always been captured from the story's beginning as the writer simply states, and I quote, I am Sam. Sam, I am. <laughs> That Sam I am, that Sam I am, I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Oh, there's some green eggs and ham really. But just in case someone in the house today has not yet had the opportunity to be exposed to this great work, uh, it's called Green Eggs and Ham. Yeah written by Dr. Seuss, which is about a character known as Sam I Am. And Sam, who is persistent in his attempts to persuade an unnamed character to try a dish of green eggs and ham. No matter where Sam I Am offered the green eggs and ham, the unnamed character turned down Sam's offer. Sam offered the green eggs and ham here and there, but he said no. Sam offered it anywhere, but he said no. Sam even went so far and offered the green eggs and ham in a house with a mouse and a box and with a fox. Yeah. That no was what he heard. Yeah. Am I talking to anybody? Yeah. Now the story does not give us an indication if Sam I Am was the master chef responsible for this dish, and that's why he felt so strong about his green eggs and ham, or if he had just picked up the meal from his favorite diner, but the persistent actions of Sam can lead one to conclude that Sam must have believed without a shadow of a doubt that what he was offering was worth just a little bit of taste.
to this text. We become Mosby today third party witnesses of a post-crucifixion event. Where we enter into the story that's ongoing saga of God's response and resolution to the sinful nature of humanity. Jesus has already endured the pain of hanging on an old rugged cross. He's already endured the immense physical pain from nails in his hands and in his feet. The effects of being beaten in a crown of thorns pitching in his head. By now, Jesus has already endured physical pain, but he also had to endure emotional pain. The pain of watching those who God loves commit sin after sin, causing him to plead, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The pain of watching a new convert dying next to him on a cross, causing him to promise that this day you shall be with me in paradise. By now, Jesus has already endured the pain of watching his own mother lose her son, causing him to cry, Woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. Jesus has already endured the pain of, of feeling the absence of his father's presence, forcing him to cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The pain of recognizing that his body was now in need, calling him to say, I first the pain of completing his assignment, of carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, leading him to cry, I am flesh, and the pain of recognizing the death was near, calling him to say, Father, and today I commend my spirit. The post crucifixion activity in which we encounter in John chapter 20 and after Jesus' spiritless body undergoes the traditional burial process of being wrapped in linen. It was after Jesus was then buried in a borrowed tomb, a tomb owned by somebody else. It was after Jesus' spirit was returned to a bodily form, allowing Jesus to walk away from what seemed to be a deathly situation. And so it is we see this uh, divine woman by the name of Mary Magdalene going to a tomb, believing that she would find the crucified Jesus still there. But to her great surprise and maybe even concern, she discovered that Jesus' body was not where they put him. But the problem was, my brothers and my sisters, that Mary was unfortunately looking for a crucified Jesus in a post-resurrection moment. And the reality is, Mary, if she was oftentimes our own issue, yes, I know we believe that Jesus died on the cross for the remission of our sins. Yes, we believe that he was buried, but on the third day, rolled while power in his head. But sometimes, the way we live out our lives, sometimes how we treat each other, sometimes how we mismanage the trouble, that comes knocking down our doors. How we tell God when God keeps telling us yes. How we ignore what God is trying to do in our life. How we are disobedient. God tells us to go right and we go left. And as if we are looking for a crucified Jesus knowing that on the third day he got up all power in his hands. And because God desires God's people to all Jesus as a resurrected Savior, God will remain a persistent presence yeah. in our lives. Yeah. I know you go to Bible study. I know you're in your word. I know you are up here on a Sunday morning. But sometimes, even as disciples, sometimes as Christians, we will forget that we serve a God who is able to do all things. And so God got to keep showing up. And God has to be persistent. And God remain consistent to remind us who God said he was. God will keep showing up even when we walk away. God will press after us. Even when you change what you think will make you look different so you are hiding from what God has called you to do, will remain consistent. And I don't know if that's good news for anybody on today, but I'm excited to know that I serve a God that even when I act silly, Will remain 
your system uh -huh. until you and I are convinced witnesses. It's an attack to be a witness, my brothers and my sisters, means to be able to recognize for yourself God's goodness. To be a witness means to have been present so as to be able to testify just how good God is. In other words, to be a witness means to have seen, heard, felt, tasted, or even smelled the miracles of God. So as a first-hand witness, the writer John retells an account of Jesus appearing to Mary and his disciples in a bodily form. The text lets us know that those who had traveled from town to town with Jesus prior to his death healing the sick and, and delivering of the captives and giving hope to the hopeless hid behind closed locked doors. Those who were informed by Jesus prior to his death that soon he would die but yet live hid behind locked closed doors. But the text says Jesus appeared in a bodily form uh, despite the locked doors. Now, I have read this text many times. I've probably been preached it one time a long time ago, and, and I, I was excited just like many of you probably get excited to know that God can move through locked doors. It's exciting to know that God can move through and any obstacle that the enemy tried to put in our path. Do you know that? When I read this text, I now shout on the fact that not only can God move through an obstacle, God has the ability to move through an obstacle that I put in God's way. Jesus also knew 
the son of his very own disciples, son of those who claim to believe in him, still doubted what he said he was capable of doing. And sometimes we do that even now. Sometimes we know that God is a way maker, but in the midst of it, when our back is against the wall, when trouble keeps knocking on our door, when the bills start piling up, sometimes we forget that God is slain. So that's why God will come and perform a mighty miracle in your life. It's just not so you will be blessed. It's so you will know exactly who Jesus said he was. Although we have the ability ourselves, we can't be in the physical presence of Jesus. We have to realize that God can and God still performs miracles so that we can be a witness to just how awesome he really is. I know we may not be able to see for ourselves Jesus taking only five loaves of barley bread and two little fish to feed five thousand, but we can certainly be a witness when God puts food on our table, even when the money is low. When Jesus turned water into wine, but, but we can certainly be a witness when God turns our midnight moments into daytime. Yeah. We may not be able to see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, but, but we can certainly be a witness to God bringing life to our dead situation. Is there anybody who knows anything about the miracle of God? Has God shown up in your life? Jesus in their life. You know when you are participating with this. 
convince witness to who Jesus is so that you may be participating in the miracles. But finally, God will be persistent in our lives so that we see Jesus in the miracle. At the end of this chapter, my favorite part of this chapter, John writes that Jesus did many of the signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The writer John believed that no one can come to understand Jesus as the one sent by God without first seeing what he has done or what he was capable of doing. Therefore, the miracles that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples were not solely done so somebody might be blessed, healed, or delivered, but they were done so that Jesus' identity might be revealed. In other words, the miracles performed were indicators of who Jesus was. So in other words, both in order to have 